Well, hey, I'm excited to be with you. Uh, going to be a great Sunday today. If you're brand new to our church, come on, say welcome, everybody. We're so honored to have you here. I know we're kind of crazy. We meet in tents year-round. We've been in a tent for, I think, almost a year and a half now. year and a half. Hanging out in tents. God has been so kind. We've only had one rain Sunday. How wild is God? He's like, yeah, it's not going to rain while they're in the tents. It'll rain during the week. We had a hurricane this week. My backyard, there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's crazy. But uh, actually, one of, our, one of our tents went home to be with the Lord. And then uh, we brought a new crew out. They actually revived this tent. We saw the dead raised. Because that thing got obliterated last, last week. Anyways, uh, so good to be here with you guys today. If you're brand new to our church, welcome. Every week we do what we're doing. We, we honor God through music. Uh, we believe that there's something about music and honoring God through, through, through music that touches his heart, that causes his presence to become known. Some of you are like, there's a good vibe, there's a good aura, there's a good energy. Well, the energy has a name. He's called the Spirit of God. And uh, we honor him, and when we do, he shows up. When God shows up, people start feeling him, sensing him, hearing him, and the goodness of God starts to change people from the inside out. It's pretty wild. And so uh, we do it every week. It's been a revival that's hit. We've, uh, we've seen this year. It's crazy. crazy. Last year, the church uh, tripled. This year, it tripled again. And uh, it's crazy in, uh, I don't know, we, we, we were about 170-something Sundays into this thing. And just this year alone, we had the most people come to faith that we've ever seen. On Sundays alone, we've had over 1,500 people. Sundays alone in 2021, churches are shutting down, going out of business, and we're busting at the seams. I believe the future of the church belongs to, to churches that honor the presence of God. You honor the presence, there's going to be courage. And uh, we're not going to bow to society. We're not scared of mandates and government regulations. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We aren't shutting this, we're not shutting this church down again, I'll tell you that. Ain't happening. It's essential. If you're going to keep your dispensaries open, we're going to keep this place open. Y'all want to get high out there? We're going to meet with the most high in here. And so, uh, yeah, we ain't going anywhere. So um, excited to have you here today. Um, and we're, uh, we're, we're a church that I believe that people that normally don't like church like to go to. I would say even if you're atheist today, I would still come here. So the people are way nicer than the bar. People are better looking. Can I get an amen? They're, you don't have to be scared of them like friendly people. You're going to hear some good news today. Who needs some good news? I've listened to all the false prophets on MSNBC, CNN. My God, I got my antidepressants after watching the news. I need, come on, I need some good news. Who wants some good news up in here? I don't care if it's conservative. Right? I'm just, I'm, the church is the one place I get good news every week. So even if I didn't believe in God, I'd come every Sunday. Some of you do. And uh, it's the goodness of God that wears you down. And eventually, I mean, I just, he is real. All right, fine. But man, we're going to have a good time today. I'm so honored that you're here. Uh, if you're brand new to our church, I do this every week, but I actually open up the Bible. We're going to go to Luke, uh, Matthew, excuse me, Matthew chapter 2. And maybe you only come to church this time of year, every year, and you're like, why? Is there not other chapters out of the Bible except Matthew 2 and Luke chapter 2? There is, but we talk about this during Christmas every year. So if you want a different passage, you've got to come on a different day. Deal? And uh, I'm going to take a little bit of an unconventional approach. Is that okay today? I know sometimes we go to church on uh, the holidays, and like, man, I hope the preacher brings that really encouraging just really fluffy message. Makes me just want to cuddle on that little blanket of fluff and leave. I just feel so good about myself. And I get my little fix until next Christmas. Well, I don't have that message today. I'm about to preach till my underwear get wet. Come on, somebody. I'm going in today. Sorry, I was too much. But I, uh, I got my Bible here. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 2. If you have a sense of humor, say Amen. And uh, we're going to get after it this morning. I'm going to tell a couple jokes. I have two kids, so they will be dad jokes. But if you have your Bible, I'm going to read uh, 12 verses, Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to talk to you today about another way. Everybody's living some way, but I want to let you know that with Jesus, there is a, there's another way. And uh, the wise men show us that there is another way. And so I'm going to do my very best. I would love it if you lean in. It's okay to say amen. It's okay to say to preach. And uh, I know some people are offended by loud churches. I'm, I'm offended by quiet churches. How about that? You like that? I'm offended. 
I'm offended that you get more excited for strangers in uniforms carrying a leather ball running across the field. I'm more offended at that. You get excited about that. But the God that saved your soul, kicked the devil in the teeth, bought you back, sitting here all quiet and sophisticated. Where are you at at the Chargers game? So make no apologies about it. We're a loud church. Why are you loud? Because there's something about the energy of the room that brings the best out of God. Amen. Well, I don't like loud churches. Well, you like getting healed, don't you? Yeah. Then just go with it. Yeah. Well, I don't like loud churches. Well, you like getting touched by God, don't you? Yeah. Then just go with it. Yeah. Well, I didn't grow up that way. It's all right. We can start new habits. Yeah. Y'all with me today? Yeah. I feel like, come on, who wants to do some holy cow tipping today? Yeah. Kicking some sacred cows up in Orange County. I know. I'm just not like that. Well, you win the lottery, you are. Yeah. You get some good news. If it's good enough news, you'll change. You guys ready to go? Who's fired up for church? Anybody fired up? Feel this presence. I want to read that Matthew chapter 2 today. This is a famous portion. If you've been to church on uh, Christmas, you've probably heard this taught before, but I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach, and uh, we're going to go a little bit harder than usual. Is that all right? It says this. Now, after Jesus was born, when was it? So just, just to be clear, I know the nativity scene at Costco has the wise men in there. They weren't there. It's okay, don't be sad, but the wise men actually weren't there at the birth. When they came, he was a young child. That's why Herod killed the children that were 24 months and below, because he thought that Jesus was 24 months or below. So let's read. Matthew wants to make a point, so we'll see it a few times here. But he came when he was a young uh, young child. Uh, They came to Judea in the days of Herod the king, and wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And they said this really big question. Say it with me. Where is he? Say it again. Where is he? biggest question in the life of a human being is uh if god is real where is he i can't see him where is he they say where is he who has been born king of the jews king 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 of the jews we've seen a star from the east and we have come here to worship him herod the king herod the king heard of this and he was troubled why because there was another king he heard about and all of jerusalem that was with him and he was gathered with all the chief priests all the scribes all the religious elites, all the cemetery or seminary graduates. And he inquired to them, he said, hey, where is Jesus or where is Christ, the Lord, supposed to be born? And the religious leaders of the day said, we know where he's going to be born. He's going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written, right in the prophet Micah, it says, uh, uh, it, it says uh, the, Bethlehem, you in the land of Judah, and not the least among the, the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd branch my people. <laughs> Kidding. That was just, just shepherd. No branch in there. Shepherd my people Israel. Now I want you to think about this. If you don't believe in God today, we know atheists come every week. Agnostics come every week. We're glad you're here. But I want you to think about a book that was written 700 years before that would forecast, guy said 700 years before, that the Savior was going to be born in a Lake Arrowhead, right? And 700 years later, the, the Savior was born in Lake Arrowhead. Out of everywhere in the world, one time he was born, the exact insignificant small town location is where he was born at. That's exactly what happened. Bethlehem was a tiny town. 700 years before, they said, this is what the Bible says, this is what God said. And Herod, when he heard this, he secretly called the wise men, determining that the time that the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go search carefully for the young child. For the what? Not baby. Sorry, nativity saying. For the what? (laughs) Young child. And when you have found him, bring him back to me. Bring bring, Bring back word that I might come also and worship him. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. I've never studied uh, uh, stars in the, the universe, but I know this. Stars don't normally went. Can we agree on that? But it went before them, and it came and stood over the place where the young child, what? Was. And this, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. It was awesome. And when they had come into the house, not the cave, not the manger, but when they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down. And they worshipped him. Well, that's kind of crazy. And when they opened up their treasuries, they presented gifts. They gave gifts to him. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. How many have those three on your Christmas list? It's Orange County, so it's probably one of them. Then being divinely warned in a dream. 
being divinely warned in a dream from God, they should not return to Herod. They departed back to their own country. They went back to where they were before, their own country, their own family, their own friends, but they went back uh, another way. Another way. Yeah. I want to talk to you today about another way. Yeah. Where is he? Yeah. Father, we just love you so much today. We thank you for what you've done this year, all the lives that have been transformed marriages that have been restored, prodigals that have come home, miracles that have happened, bodies that have been healed, minds that have been healed, God, hearts that have been softened. We ask you today at the last two Sundays of the year that, God, you would give us your very, very best. We thank you that you always save the best for last as you broke up the best wine at the end of the wedding. I pray you break up the best presence, the best glory, the best, the best, the best uh, sense of you. I pray that, Lord, the last two Sundays will be the best Sundays of the year. In Jesus' name, if God, if you believe it, come on, say amen. Amen. Come on, one more time. Say a good amen. amen. Uh, I grew up, uh, grew up in uh, the high desert, Palm de Lancaster. Shut up. Just one, you know, I didn't think so. If you are from there, you ain't telling anybody. We didn't have much money growing up. Our welcome mat just said, well, we couldn't afford the rest. Mom was trying to save money, so I was a millennial kid that had a mom that cut my hair. Any witnesses in here? Whoever had a mom that's like, nah, we don't need to spend that money. My mom got the, uh, come on, the crochet scissors out. The cereal bowl, come on. Anybody get a cereal bowl haircut? Where's, where's anybody out here in Millennial? It was the trend for a while there. It was like, oh, what do you need? Uh, scissors and a cereal bowl. Mom gave me some of the worst haircuts I've ever seen. Got childhood pictures I've never shown anybody crazy. I, I got these bowl haircuts. And mom finally was like, look, if you don't, if she graduated, you know, when my desire for haircuts went beyond her, 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 her knowledge of s- cereal bowl haircuts, she uh, graduated me on to beauty schools. Now, if you don't know what a beauty school is, it's where people go to learn how to cut hair. And they need these uh, crash dummies <laughs> to come in and to basically learn how to fail. So if you want to get into gambling, you just go in there and get a haircut. Because it's a roll of the dice. Like, man, this could be a good day or this could be a bad month. Because that's really what a haircut is. It's either going to make your day or it's going to ruin your month. Can I get a witness? Finally graduated beyond the beauty school. Mom goes, oh, Walmart cuts hair? I'm like, yeah. $20 haircut? That's, that's not bad. I'm like, well, Mom, it's, it's $5, but the hat's going to cost $15. It's going to cover my head for the next four weeks. You ever... Sorry, tough crowd, tough crowd. I'm going somewhere. You ever walked into some place and walked out another way? I'm telling you, a good haircut make your day, bad haircut ruin your month. I've had moments that I've walked out one way, and I've, I've had times that I've walked out another way. People, people ask me all the time, they go, man, what's the big deal? Christmas is just some commercialized, money-making, grab, grab, and whatever it's called. Grab... Grab and snatch, snatch and grab, grab and go. I don't know, grab something. <laughs> just some money grab. That's what I was looking for, money grab. It's just some, it's just some Christian North American holiday. What's the, what's the significance about Christmas? And I really do believe the bedrock of Christianity, Christmas comes on the scene as a microcosm of what Christianity is all about. It is about men that travel that should not have traveled. It's about people that should not have had an encounter with God. Truthfully, it's about wicked men that had wicked ways, wicked practices from the east that were descendants of Balaam, that were into dark arts and astrology and all the things that you should not be into that caught wind that there was a power more superior than the dark powers. And they were willing to pray a bold prayer and said, God, if you are real, if the star is you, where are you? And I would stand before everyone today and say that every human being in this tent and online has something in common. That every one of us has asked the question at some point, where did I come from? Why am I here? And where the heck am I going when this life is over? Many people plan diligently for retirement, but many people don't plan at all for eternity. And the reality is, is if we are here, are we a cosmic accident? Did we evolve out of nothing? Are we just some manufactured uh, byproduct of gas balls flying together? Or was there a creator that gave us a a moral compass? Is there someone that made us in his image? I would argue and say if we are cosmic accidents, why has humanity throughout history always viewed murder as evil? Has always viewed courage as good? 
if we are just some random evolution of apes and monkeys, why do we know right from wrong? Why is hurting kids wrong? Why is, why is being generous to the poor is good? Why do we feel what we feel if we are just animals? And the answer is, it's because there was someone that programmed us. And I don't care who you are, how much money you have, how good looking you are, where you live, how you grew up. Everyone has asked the question, look, is there a God? And if there is, where is he? Where is he? I came to preach to somebody today that's looking for answers. I came today to tell you that you can go through Christmas and still miss Christ. Every year in America, go, people go through Christmas and they miss Christ in Christmas. And I felt as I was praying this week, the Lord wanted me to tell you that Christmas this year, you can encounter Christ. Many people treat Christmas as a holiday, but not as a celebration of Christ. Well, I get paid time off of work. Well, it's more than that. It is a celebration of Christ mass. Jesus came into the world. What's Christmas all about? Well, it's about God righting a wrong. Christianity at 36,000 feet is, it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter three. It's about when God said, if anyone eats this tree, they will die. And God can't lie. Two things God can't do. God can't get better and God can't lie. God can't get better because to get better would insinuate you can improve. That God cannot do. But God cannot lie. Can I get a witness in here? So when he said, if you eat this, you'll die, he made a promise. This is my word. If you eat, you die. So when they ate, someone had to die. So we fast forward a few thousand years, and God sends his son to pay for the wrong of Adam. That's why Christ came. He came because someone had to die. And he sends it through a teenage girl that was engaged to a man named Joseph, a carpenter, and says, look, you're going to live for about 33, 34 years. And then on the cross, Isaiah 53, the iniquities of the world will be put on him. And he's going to feel the wrath of God. And he's going to feel the weight of God, his wrath. And that's why he's going to shout out on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did he say that? Because God had to put your sin, my sin, Adam's sin, someone had to die. And we celebrate Christmas, and many people, they never taste Christmas, never sense God, never see God. And I want you to know that you, you would not be the first to miss out on Christ on Christmas. I would go on the record to say that the very first Christmas, there was three people that missed Jesus. First person that missed Jesus on Christmas was the innkeeper. And the innkeeper, did he missed Jesus. Can you imagine? This guy was so busy. His business was so blessed. Every room was rented out. Now, not in the hotel industry, or I don't own an Airbnb house. But I know this, that if you're fully rented out, that is a lucrative moment. If you're fully rented out, come on, business is good. But I want you to know that if you can be blessed, and you can be good, and you can be full, but not make room for Jesus, you will fall into the same sin that the innkeeper messed up with, that he actually did not make room for Christ. And I believe God told me there's people in Orange County that you're blessed, that your rooms are full, that your business is booming, that you're you're married to a spouse. Everything looks good, but you have not made room for. And I want you to know, man, you can miss out on Jesus on Christmas if you don't make. He was the first guy to miss Christmas. Who else missed Christmas? How about King Herod? King Herod was so threatened with insecurity that there was a new king in town. Wise men came from the east. They said, hey, he was born. We saw a star. There's a new king of Israel. He's like, well, I'm the king. And you know what I've learned? There's people still today in California, in America, that are scared to admit that there could be a king greater than them. They miss Christmas because of the insecurity of going, well, if he's Lord, if he's king, then I can't sit on the throne anymore. And some people are scared of Jesus being real because if he is, things might have to change. But I want you to know that any God change he brings into your life is is better than things staying the same with you. Big thought. God will never ask you to do anything that's not better for you in the long run. So when God says to sacrifice, it's for your benefit. If God says to give up a relationship, it's for your benefit. If God says to give, to get, it's for your benefit. If God says to forgive, to move forward, it's for your benefit. When God says you want to go up, go down, you want to be great, become a servant, God says it's for your benefit, not his. Can I get an amen in the tents? 
We serve a God that is a backwards, forward, right side up God. And I've learned this with Jesus is that many people miss out because they're scared that if he's real, if he's Lord, I can't be anymore. And we have people, man, that are rich, that are famous, that are empty. They're as straight as a gun barrel, but they're just as empty as a gun barrel. Because they've never let Jesus on the throne of their lives. King Herod missed Christmas because he sat where Jesus belonged. And there is people today that are sitting in God's seat. And you never tasted the freedom. That's why you're anxious at night. That's why you wake up in cold sweats. That's why fear has paralyzed your lifestyle. That's why you're scared of your own shadow. You're freaked out by politics, freaked out by economies. Everything scares you because, listen, you'll always, you'll always only be scared of the things if they're, if they're bigger than the, than the God that you serve. I think fears are just, they're, 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 they're uh, actually proportional to the thing that we go after. So if you have a little God, you'll be scared of everything. But if you have a big God, you'll be scared of nothing. It's kind of like if you grow up, come on, who had, a, who had a, a childhood that you told all your friends that you better not mess with me because my dad, he would whoop your dad. My dad is bigger than, my dad did UFC. My dad did Tai Bo to get in shape. This guy is a machine. You ever have that moment that you're like, man, my dad, I'm pretty sure my dad is better than everybody's dad. You go into that fearful environment with bullies with no fear because you know how big your dad is. This is a goofy analogy, but many times we are so scared of everything because we don't think our dad is that big. But I believe this, that the wise men, the wise men realized from King Herod, King Herod missed Christmas because he was sitting on the throne that belonged to Jesus. Innkeeper missed Jesus, didn't make room. King Herod missed Jesus because he didn't want to have another king that was better than him. He didn't want to have a king that was above all kings. And how about this? Who else missed Christmas? How about the religious? This blew me away. Wise men from the east that were pagan aristocrats. They were wealthy men, but they were into dark arts. They were into astrology. They studied soothsaying, magic, all the dark stuff. And they came from the east because they were hungry for a superior power. And you know they came to to find out where Jesus was? They came to the religious people in the church. Hey, guys, do you know where Jesus is? And here's the audacity of the church. They said, yeah, we know where he is, Bethlehem. You know, you know, why, you know why religious people miss Christmas? Because they know where Jesus is, but they refuse to saddle up and go to him. We still live in a period of time today. I know the scriptures, but you don't know the spirit of God. You know Hebrew, but you don't know him. You know Greek, but you don't know God. Many people today study the scriptures, but I want to tell you that the written word is always designed to lead us to the living word. And many people miss God because they worship the written word, which we're supposed to do, but we're supposed to encounter the living word. These guys were so busy in Bible studies, and I know this, and I know that, and they knew where the Savior was going to be born, but they stayed in the West. Why wouldn't you go? Because that's what religion does. It's more proud that it knows about Jesus than encountering him. I don't kick in some sacred cows. Mark, I only come once a year. I know, that's why I'm preaching hard today. Because some of you heard the fluffy message that God loves you and his grace will wipe your behind. And you come once a year for fire insurance to avoid hell. Listen, Jesus is real. We need to go all the way in. If heaven is real, we got to go all the way in. If hell is real, we got to go all the way in. If there is a life after this life, we got to go all the way in. This lukewarm, half hearted, sophisticated, it's all just fake, Mark Preach. I know that Christianity's fake. I heard Stephen Hawkins, the famous atheist, he said Christianity is a fairy tale made up for people that are scared of the dark. I say to Stephen Hawkins that atheism is a fairy tale of people that are scared of the light. We serve a God that is absolute light. In him there is no darkness at all. I feel like preaching today. You can miss Christmas. The religious men, they're like, ah, no, we know where he is, but we ain't going. They were more obsessed with studying the scriptures than encountering the spirit. 
And there is people still today that would rather waste all of their intellectual properties trying to argue why the Spirit of God doesn't heal, doesn't speak, doesn't do signs, doesn't do wonders, why women can't be in ministry, why miracles aren't for today, while the, while the power of the church left with the apostles. You're wasting your energies with doubt? You know what doubt will do? I feel like preaching a little bit. I'm sorry, guys. You know what doubt will do? When the angel came to Zechariah and said, you're going to have a baby. I know you're in a senior center. I know you're about to hang up the cleats. You're about to go into the next life. And the angel said, but before you do, before you die, you're going to have a baby. And Zechariah had three strikes against him. He doubted three fronts. He goes, how can this happen? I'm too old. But he was smart. He said, and my wife is well advanced in years. He was quick on his feet. He wasn't about to call his lady. Come on, old. He said, oh yeah, she's advanced in years. <laughs> you know what? He was doubtful. He was doubtful on all three fronts. You know what he's doubtful of? He goes, how can someone get pregnant that's old? I'm too old. And my wife, she's advanced in years. Three strikes of doubt. You know what happened to him when he doubted God's message? The angel said, um, you're going to see it, but until you see it, your voice is gone. You know what doubt has done since the very first Christmas? It has stolen the voice of God's people. You know why people don't listen to you? Because doubt stole your voice. You know why people don't believe the Jesus that you serve? Because doubt has stolen your voice. We have people that go to seminaries and they waste all of their energies arguing over why the scripture says this, but you can't encounter Jesus there. And I believe that the scriptures are a signpost to lead us to encountering the Son. Yeah, I feel like preaching in Orange County. What do you know? I know this, that they missed Christmas. The religious people, they knew it up here, but they didn't go out there. You know where miracles happen? Miracles happen when you pursue God and pray, when you hear his voice and obey it, and you take action. That's why the brother of Jesus said, faith without works is. You can know up here all day long. The devil's not scared of you knowing. He's scared of you going. Where are the people that say, Mark, if it's real, I'm going. If I can see him, I'm going. If I can worship him, I'm going. If I can hear his voice, I'm going. But we're, we're, we're too excited for Hollywood. We're too excited, man, to be famous. We're too excited to get rich, build our castles, not God's kingdom. We're too possessed with temporary things. And we're, we're, we're settling like the religious people. And there's three groups in Orange County that are missing Jesus today. It's the innkeepers that are blessed but too full to make space for God. There's people that are like King Herod that, man, I enjoy being fully in control. And here's the problem. You can be fully in control or you can be fully surrendered to God, but you cannot be both. And the last group that misses Jesus is the religious people that are so proud of how smart they are. But they're missing the presence of Jesus. I always love when people get up, these smart guys that study way more than I study and know way more than I know and, and are way, way higher IQ than I am. I always love when I think about this, man, do their lives look like the early apostles? Are they praying for the sick? Are people getting healed in their churches? I'm not trying to throw rocks, but do they have the fruit of Jesus? Jesus said, by this you will know them. Do they bear good it is the fruit. What is the fruit that we're looking for? The Bible. If your church doesn't look like Acts, find a new church. Well, he's really smart. I don't care if you got more degrees than a thermometer. You can start right on time and you can end completely dull. Many people are going to dead churches with dead preachers that are preaching dead messages that no one's coming out of the grave in. But I want to tell you that since the origins of Christianity, 120 people turned the known world, a multinational, national na nation uh, movement across the globe started with 120. Not, not religious elites, eyewitnesses. Christianity at its grassroots level, it wasn't Jesus didn't go to Jerusalem. He didn't say, where's the, where's the smartest seminary students? He went to the Sea of Galilee. He went to cussers. He went to tax collectors. He went to uneducated, untrained idiots. And he said, when you taste, when you see how real I am, you're going to take this to the highways, to the byways. You're going to invite the whole world to the wedding's feast of the Lamb. Where are the eyewitnesses today? We got people missing Christmas because they are so, so captivated by studying the Bible, but not being the people of the Bible. 
Shall we be the church in the book of Acts or shall we not? And I feel like God says if if we will do a couple things. Number one, expect. You know why most churches don't expect, don't experience something great? It's because they don't expect it. Well, I don't really expect my habits to go away that are bad. I don't really expect God to change my marriage. It sucks. I don't really expect God to to do something with my crazy kids. They're just going through a wild spell. They got to go sow their wild oats. I don't believe that garbage. I believe you can taste God and his goodness at a young age and never want to leave his side. I believe that we got to stop making excuses and expecting our kids to fail. No, I expect you. Look, you're going to be a good athlete because I'm going to send you to environments that teach you how to be a good athlete. And you're going to be a good follower of Jesus because I'm going to put you in environments that you learn how to follow Jesus. Yeah, you're going to go to basketball camp and be a good baller, but you're going to go to good church camp every summer and be a good Christian. And parents out here, I'm summonsing you. I know you love your kids. But what good is it if they get scholarships for sports and their soul goes to hell? I know I'm kicking some religious cows today. But I'm saying if we're going to teach our kids anything, let's teach our kids. As for me, my house, we're serving God. Your kids will cha- they'll champion the passion you have. My daughters love watching basketball with me now because I have passion for basketball. My daughters love listening to worship music with me because I love listening to worship music. Your kids will do more of what you are, what walks in fathers, runs in sons and daughters. But we live in a society that says, do as I say, not as I. Where are the Christians that say, hey, you're going to be all right. If you follow me as I follow Christ, we're going to be all right. We live in a society today that's scared of putting God first. Well, if I put him first, I'll I'll, I'll fall behind. I've never seen anyone put God first and fall behind. Case in point, let me give you one. Chick-fil-A. You're telling me you're going to take one-seventh of your business opportunity and shut down an entire day of the week, and you're still going to give KFC a black eye. Raising Cane's a bloody nose. How are you destroying all the other business? Well, it's the Bible. If you put God, he blesses the rest. Hashtag Christian chicken. Yeah. You put him first, he blesses the rest. We know that people have missed the Christ since the very beginning. How did the wise men experience? How did they encounter? How, How did this all happen? Well, number one, they had an expectation. They traveled 800 to 1,000 miles. Can you imagine? Riding an Arabian horse. It wasn't camels. Another nativity scene flaw. Arabian horses. 800 to 1,000 miles. You roll up to Bethlehem. You would fall on your face and stretch out too. I rode a horse for two hours in Mammoth. I was sore for six weeks. They pull up to Bethlehem. And imagine this. Aristocrats socialites, magicians that were famous, that were, that were, that were well, uh, well respected, they see a toddler and they fall on their face to him. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's kind of crazy, kind of weird, unless Jesus is God. One of my, one of, I love this pastor, Robert Morris. He told a story about a lady in his church who lived in New Zealand, and when the queen came to visit, she loved the queen, read all these books about the queen, and she said this, that when, it, when she came, she was short. And when the queen was passing by, she couldn't see the queen, so she found a trash can. Yeah. And she got up on a trash dumpster. Wow. Sophisticated woman. Yeah. And when the queen was passing by, she lifted her voice. She began to clap, began to shout, because she loved the queen. Yeah. And she told Pastor Robert this. She said, uh, she said um, I suppose that if the queen wasn't passing by, I would have looked crazy. But because royalty was passing by, my demonstrative, number two, expression. You know why some people never encounter God? Because number one, they don't expect to encounter him. God's not real. Yeah, you won't expect anything. Miracles aren't for today. Exactly. You're living that. You can't hear God's voice. Exactly. You'll never hear it. If you believe you can't, you're right. But if you believe you can, you're right. That's why Jesus said audacious things according to your faith. Let it be done. Well, my pastor said in cemetery, and he said that you can't see miracles anymore. Exactly. He's gotten three decades of getting what he's expected. But here in this church, every week people get healed because people show up expecting it. Every week people get saved in this church. Why? Every week we expect it. 
Every week, drug addicts are getting liberated. We expect it. Dead marriages, broken families. We expect God to move. And when he moves, you know what happens? You begin to express worship. I remember going to church before our church started in Orange County. Went to a great church. Had amazing musicians. An incredible pastor. Shared an incredible message. And I'm moved to tears. My eyes are closed. It's me and Jesus. And I was irritated. I said, God, why would you send me somewhere that has a great church like this? And the Holy Spirit said, Mark, open your eyes. And when I did, I saw a sterile room. People sipping their lattes, eating their Costco muffins. And the presence of God was stirring the room, and everyone standing there like some coffee shop musician was playing. And the Lord told me, he said, this county, knows how to, they, this county knows how to gather in my name, but they don't know how to express worship to me. Well, we're not those crazy charismaniacs, Pentecostals. We're not into that stuff. I want you to know, Orange County, that clapping your hands is not a Pentecostal idea. It's a Bible idea. Shouting to God with a voice of triumph is not a, it's not a, it's not a charismatic idea. It's a Bible idea. Lifting up a new song to the Lord is not a Bethel idea. It is a Bible idea. I want you to know that lifting up holy hands, it's not a weird spiritual idea. It's a Bible idea. Well, it's not my personality. I've seen you at sporting events. Losing your mind. Painting your chest. Well, just not like that. I've seen you win the lottery. Introverts get crazy. If the news is good enough, it'll move you. If the news is good enough, it'll move you. And here's the problem. We have churches preaching okay news. So we're giving God okay worship. I believe you can tell a lot of times the gratitude of someone's heart by the way they express worship. These guys traveled a thousand miles. They fell down, expressed worship, which it would have been weird unless the king was passing by. And on the ground, they expressed worship. Are you still with me today? To the king of kings. And as they did, they opened up their treasuries. We let people, oh, this is part of the message that pastor asked for money. I'm not asking for money. God doesn't need your money. Where we're going, the streets are made out of gold. Talking about your $20. God doesn't need your 20 bucks. You don't give so God can pay his bills. I'll tell you what your treasure is. Treasure is what you value the most. Some of you don't even care about money. It's all about traveling. I just want to see the world. Live out of a backpack for six months. God bless you. I just, I just work. Look, what's valuable? Your time. Look, Mark, I'll give God money. I'll write my check once a year, but I'm not going to come to church every week. I don't have that kind of time. You know what you value the most? What, or what your treasure is, it's exactly what you value the most. Jesus said, if you put money somewhere, your heart will follow it, though. You spend all your money on snowboard passes and gear and, and, and trips, you will start thinking about it during the week. You'll start getting excited about it. Why? Because your heart follows your treasure. Treasure's not always money. Sometimes treasure is time. Sometimes it's your talent. And whatever you want God to bless, you have to give him the first of it. You express it. They opened their treasuries. And when they did, it was extravagant. They opened up their treasuries. They gave gold. It represented the kingship of Jesus. They gave frank frankincense. He was a priest. And they gave myrrh, which was a, a burial supply, to get his body ready that one day he will be a sacrifice, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So they give him their very best. And by the way, if you want to know the secret to what makes people miserable, I'll tell you what it is. The fastest way to dissatisfaction. You want to know what it is? The fastest way to dissatisfaction is giving your best to something other than God. You want to know you're miserable? You have a mansion, you married a model, six houses, 72-inch TVs, and Aspen and Vail. That's from the Elf. You want to know you're, still, you're void on the inside? Because you spent your best on yourself. And that's what the wise men teach us. They teach us, you know what extravagance is all about? When you see who he is and you discover how real God is and how good God is, you will actually expect him. You'll express worship. And when you express worship, you'll begin to, it'll open a part of your heart that's extravagant. Throughout the Bible, God has always loved extravagance. That's why David, he, imagine David. He's like, I want to build a church. 
And God says, no, you can't. You've, you've killed too many people. But your son will. So you know what David did? He saved up modern day $21 billion worth of supplies so that Solomon could build a church that was so beautiful the eyes of the world would look to it. Extravagant. Extravagant saving. Solomon, when he gets inaugurated as king as a young man, most kings would kill one animal and sacrifice to God. That day he sacrificed 1,000. Extravagant. And his extravagance activated something in God that God has never done before or since. God came in a dream and said, whatever you ask for, I'll give you. What do you want? He said, wisdom, so I can lead the people well. God gave it to him. Why? Because he was extravagant. What was God drawn to? How about, a, how about a woman that broke open an alabaster flask of Gucci perfume? It was worth a year's wages. Orange County, that's like 800 grand, okay? For some of you, God bless you. <laughs> Trying to buy a house here, good luck. Uh, it was worth a year. She broke the perfume and she poured it on Jesus and Judas was fired up. Judas the Iscariot, he was like, how, how dare you waste so much money? He didn't care about the money, he was a thief. And the people that are always concerned about extravagant giving in the church are usually the thieves. You're giving hundred thousand dollars to Angel House? How ridiculous. Why would, why? You, you don't even give to churches. Everyone I've ever experienced that is mad about church funds never usually gives to churches. Anyway, another message. Extravagant giving. Is it just about money, preacher? No. There was, a, there was a guy named Abraham that gave his only begotten son. Extravagant offering. And I will go on the record to say that the greatest Christmas extravagant present ever given to humanity was the Lord Jesus Christ. God sent an extravagant offering to pay for the sins. Someone had to die. Otherwise, God would have been a liar. God can't not lie. So he sends Jesus as an offering. It's extravagant. And I'll tell you what, the only reason God can ask you for your best is because he gave you his best. And I'm telling you today that God is looking for people that will express worship. People go, Mark, well, I didn't like the song we sang today. Well, to remind you, Jethro, we weren't singing for you. We were singing for God. They didn't sing my jam. It's all right, Karen. We weren't singing for you. We were, we were singing for God. Worship isn't supposed to touch your heart. It's supposed to touch God's heart. I believe that worship is a response of encountering the presence of God. And I, I mean, I just had this phrase. I read this this week. It's so, so powerful. That the ultimate goal of the church is not mission, but worship. The ultimate goal of the church is not mission, but worship. Mission only exists wherever worship does not exist. When people begin to worship mission begins to take care of itself we got to be a worshiping church well I just come late every Sunday because I don't like the music part of it I just like the good part the message well thank you but come on you're, you're robbing yourself because the music is what belongs to God the message is for you and me but the music belongs to God are you with me today we're gonna wrap this up but I feel like people need to understand that God is interested in in this extravagant worship. Stand on your feet. Finished up. I've got to say something for tonight, you know? I was blowing through my notes up here. Can I pray for you today? You know, God told me this week, because He said, Mark, there's people coming that are hard hearted towards me. You have found your identity in being an attacker of Christianity. And it's funny because God told me that He's going to heal your body physically today. And one of you, it's a sister or a mother that God is going to do a miracle for. And it's going to be an undeniable, medically documented miracle. And I want you to know that God would heal you before you believe in Him right now. To let you know there is a God. You know what He told Pharaoh? I'm going to do signs and wonders that you might know that there is a God in heaven. God's going to soften your heart like He softened Pharaoh's heart. The same God that hardens clay can melt butter. And I believe His presence is here today to soften hard hearts. You were hurt by a Christian. You were hurt by a church. I want to encourage you, if you get hurt by a Christian or a church, don't go in your mom's basement and start blogging about them. You know what you do? Is you do the same thing you do with restaurants. If you get food poisoning, you just stop going to that restaurant. Don't dedicate your life to boycotting restaurants. Find somewhere else to eat. And I feel the Lord saying, if you'll go to a new place, you'll get new food. 
And not every restaurant you go to, you get poisoning in. There are some sick restaurants, but there are some good ones too. And I believe that if you're in these tents today and you're watching online, this is a place with good food. The Spirit of God is here today. Bethlehem means house of bread. Jesus came to, he was born in a place to feed the world. And I want to pray for you right now, all over the tents. Two things I pray for, and we'll be out of here today. And we're going to come back tonight at 5 and 7. I pray right now for anyone in the tent that you feel distant from God. You feel like you've never known Him. Your heart's starting to speed up right now. God's actually going to heal you. So when you have a condition in your bones, I don't know if it's cancer or some sort of density issue, but I hear the Lord saying that I'm going to heal your bones. Yeah, He's going to heal you. And then He's going to, yeah, really? How could God know me like that? Because we serve a God that speaks. Are you some sort of psychic? No, I'm not a psychic. I'm a Christian. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Someone has a bone density issue today. Might be connected to a disease or hereditary issue condition. And God is going to heal you right now. And your heart isn't even believing in God yet. And God goes, here's a little bit of extra faith to help you believe. Because most people miss heaven by about 12 inches, the distance from your head to your heart. God will visit your brain, but he lives in your heart. And I feel faith rising right now. Someone in here, you have preliminary melanoma right now. You've had some smaller cases. And God says you're not going to die of skin cancer. Might have taken a grandfather or uncle, but it's not going to take your life. God is with you. God is for you. And the same God that can heal your skin can save your soul. So here's what we're going to do. First time, God, if you are real, where are you? God says, I'm here. Will you let me in? And if you say, Mark, I'll let him in today. This means to figure everything out. You don't have to be a rogue scholar, a theologian. You just got to go, God, if you are real, I want you in. That's where we're going to start today. Or maybe you know God's real, but you've been walking away from him. And today you're like, you know what I got to do this year? You got, you got physical goals for 2022 to excavate your six pack? How about we make a spiritual goal to excavate some faith? Let's redig the wells that you lived, you lived with when you were young. Some of you, this time next year, you're going to be more on fire for God because you're going to give God the next 12 months. If you either rededicate your life or for the first time say, God, if you are real, if you are here, I'm letting you in. I'm not going to embarrass you. I want you to lift your hands all over the tents. On the count of three, all over. Hands are already going up. I love it. One, I'm going to give you three seconds. Three seconds. More hands going up. Two, I want to rededicate. I want to put my faith in God. I'm responding right now. Lord, help him. Three, real high, real high, real high. Keep it up. Keep it up. I see many hands, many hands, many hands, many hands, many hands. I see one, two, three, four, five. Real high, six. Real high, seven. Real high, real high, real high. I see seven hands. So good, so good, so good. Eight hands. I see a little girl. That's awesome. Eight hands. So good. Nine hands. Anybody else? Anybody else? I hear the Lord saying, I offended one of you. Maybe one of my atheist, atheistic uh, one-liners. And I heard the Lord just say, don't let a flawed preacher interfere with connecting with me right now. I'm not perfect. I say things sometimes that offend people. I'm like you. You ever done that before? No? Nice to meet you, Jesus. If you've offended somebody before, I know we all have, but I hear the Lord saying, don't let, come on, a guy preaching in his wife's trousers, don't, don't, don't let the messenger deflect the message. Would you close your eyes? I feel like there's four more people that it might have been, I don't know, I, I don't know, I don't know. And you're wrestling right now, it's an internal battle. I was reading this last night out of the Bible. It says in the book of Joel that many are in the valley of decision. And I heard the Lord say there is many that are going to be here today and next week that are literally in the valley of decision. I would go on the record to say that it takes more faith to not believe in God than it does to believe in God. Because if you believe in God and you, you go after Him and you read the Bible and you invite Him into your life, you're going to live a morally good life. You're going to pay your taxes. You're going to be a good neighbor. You're going to stay married to your spouse. If you honor God's ways, you're going to live a good life. And if, if God's not real, you're going to miss out on nothing. But if you're an atheist today and you go, Mark, I don't believe in God, it takes more faith because if you live for yourself and you don't make room for Him and put Him on the throne and you don't go to where He is, if you're wrong, you don't just miss out on this life, you miss out on eternity. Today I hear the Lord saying, many are in the valley decision, but I come to summons them. I was reading this week, the Lord spoke to me. He said, Mark, proclaim among the nations, prepare for war, wake up the mighty men. 
Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat the plowsheds and the swords, the pruning hooks and the spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the nations be wakened. Put the sickle in the ground for the harvest is ripe. Come to come down and go down for the wine press is full. The vats overflow. The wickedness is great, but the multitudes, multitudes are in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The Lord will also roar out of Zion. He will utter his voice from Jerusalem. And today, I believe, is the day of salvation. Four more. You didn't raise your hand. But I hear the Lord saying, don't miss the second, second opportunity. Four more. Come on. I'm not asking you to change your life. I'm asking you to invite God in. All over, eyes closed. Every eye closed. No one looking around. Holy moment. Online, I want you to write heart. There's probably five or six people online today that need to give your life to Jesus or rededicate. But you didn't raise your hand, but you were supposed to. There's four more today. Would you raise your hand right now on the count of three? Thank you. One, two, three. Thank you. Four. Four. Anybody else? There's five. We'll take that bonus, that bonus hand. I love it. Five more. Okay, awesome. Come on, give God a good hand clap today. It's here. Hands on your heart. Be out of here in five minutes. I want you to pray this prayer. And listen, a couple of you, as you respond to God says, because you honor me, I'm going to honor you. One of you, you, you're scared of dying young. And God says, I'm going to reward you with a long life. This is the goodness of God. You, you can feel it in your heart right now. That's, it's you. Yeah, that's God. God, I want me to tell you, because you honor me, I honor you today. I want everyone to raise their hand to pray this prayer today. Say, Jesus. All over the tent, say it with me. Say, Jesus. Those online, come on, everybody, one more time. Say, Jesus, I invite you into my life. I expect that you would fill me with the Spirit of God. Would you forgive me? Would you heal me? And would you lead me from this day forward? Watch over me. Guide my life. Speak to me. In Jesus' name. Watch this. It's so good. He's going to heal right now. I feel the presence of God here to heal. If you need a physical or mental healing, I want you to raise your hand. Maybe even spiritually you got hurt as a kid in a church. God's going to heal your heart. Just lift your hands all over. Feel His glory. There's presence here to heal. Just lift your hand. God will heal you. I expect Him to heal. Hands up all over the tents. If someone's hands up next to you, don't embarrass them. Just put your hand on their shoulder real quick. The Bible says we'll lay hands on sick people and they will recover. My friend with the glasses on next to Jay, I see God even right now. He's healing. There's like a condition with your heart, your lungs. God is healing it. God's going to change your ability to breathe. And he's going to change. He's going to give you a new heart, a soft heart. There's going to be a new sensitivity to God's voice, his presence. I believe that God's going to raise you up to hear his voice and declare it to the nations. I pray that you would speak to him, Lord, starting today in a new way. Dreams, visions, visit him in the night. I pray the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge would be going to open up. And that, God, he would taste and see how real, how powerful, how good you are. In Jesus' name, hands all over. Come on, heal, heal, heal. Someone's, uh, yeah, yeah, someone's someone has some sort of pancreatic issue I pray in Jesus name I pray for someone's gallbladder you just had a gallbladder be removed I think there's other issues in your body and God is saying there's not other issues I'm healing you today I pray Lord for the person that has some sort of rash it goes from the top of your back to the bottom of your back even down to your, your thighs I pray that you would heal the rash today I pray for the person that has uh, uh, shingles I pray that you would heal it today in Jesus name yeah measles mumps I pray heal 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 yeah heal in Jesus name heal in Jesus name come on, all over the tent today would you just pray this prayer say Lord Jesus would you heal my body would you heal my mind and would you fill me with your amazing Holy Spirit guide me by your light your star lead me to Jesus that I might live a life that would worship him in Jesus name can we just sing this one last time come on sing this one last time we'll never stop can't live without you Jesus we love you and we can't get enough oh is for you. Oh, seem like you just got healed. Jesus, Come on. Seem like you just got saved. We love you. 
and we can't get enough. All this is for you, Jesus. We love you, and we'll never stop. should be the Lord, the director, the Savior, the CEO of our lives. God, would you seal this word? I pray, God, that you would encounter us in fresh ways. Give us dreams. Give us visions. Give us direction. God, sovereignly guide our lives, our families. I pray, Lord, as we celebrate this week, that it be more than giving gifts. I pray that we would connect with God. We love you so much, Jesus. Let us not miss Christ in Christmas. We love you in Jesus' name. Come on, everyone said amen.